Schmendrick was drawing pictures with his finger in a puddle of wine, and might have heard nothing at all. Drin went on. Naturally, no one ever admitted to leaving the child in the market place, and though we searched every house from cellar to dovecote, we never found it again. I might have concluded that wolves had taken the brat, or even that I dreamed the whole encounter, cats and all, but for the fact that on the very next day a herald of King Haggard's came riding into town, ordering us to rejoice. After thirty years of waiting, the king had a son at last. He looked away from the look on Molly's face. Our foundling, incidentally, was a boy. Schmendrick licked the tip of his finger and looked up. Lear, he said thoughtfully. Prince Lear. But there was no other way to account for his appearance. Not likely, Druin snorted. Any woman that would marry Haggard, even Haggard would refuse. He gave out the tale that the boy was a nephew, whom he graciously adopted on the death of his parents. But Haggard had no relatives, no family. There are those who say that he was born of an overcast, as Venus was born out of the sea. No one would ging give King Haggard a child to raise. The magician calmly held out his glass and filled it himself when Durin refused. Well, he got one somewhere, and good for him. But how could he have come by your little cat, baby? Drin said, He walks in Hagsgate at night, not often, but now and then. Many of us have seen him, tall, haggard, gray as driftwood, prowling alone under an iron moon, picking up dropped coins, broken dishes, spoons, stones, handkerchiefs, rings, stepped-on apples, anything, everything. No reason to it. It was Haggard who took the child. I am s as certain of it as I am certain that Prince Lear is the one who will topple the tower and sink Haggard and Hagsgate together. I hope he is, Molly broke in. I hope Prince Lear is that baby you left to die, and I hope he drowns your town, and I hope the fish nibble you bare as corn cobs. Schmendrick kicked her ankle as hard as he could, for the listeners were beginning to hiss like embers, and a few were rising to their feet. He asked again, what is it you wish of me? You are on your way to Haggard's castle, I believe. Schmendrick nodded. Ah, Drin said. Now, a clever magician would find it simple to become friendly with Prince Lear, who is reputed to be a young man of eagerness and curiosity. A clever magician might be acquainted with all manners of odd potions and powders, poppets and filters, herbs and banes and unguents. A clever magician, mind you, I said, clever no more. A ma clever magician might be able, under the proper circumstances, he let the rest drift away unspoken, but no less said. For a meal, Schmendrick stood up, knocking his chair over. He leaned on the table with both hands, breathing harshly. Is that the going rate right these days? Dinner and wine, the price of a poisoned prince. You'll have to do better than that, friend Drin. I wouldn't do a chimney sweep for such a fee. Molly Grew gripped his arm, crying, What are you saying? The magician shook her hand away, but at the same time he lowered one eyelid in a slow wink. Drin leaned back in his chair, smiling. I never haggle with a professional, he said. Twenty-five pieces of gold. They haggled for half an hour, Schmendrick demanding a hundred gold pieces, and Drin refusing to offer more than forty. At last they settled at seventy, half to be paid then and half upon Schmendrick's successful return. Drin counted out the money on the spot from a leather pouch on, on his belt. "'You'll spend the night in Hagsgate, of course,' he said. "'I would be pleased to put you up myself.' But the magician shook his head. "'I think not. We will go on to the castle, since we are so near it now. The sooner there, the sooner back, eh?' And he grinned, a crafty and conspiratorial grin. "'Haggard's castle is always dangerous,' Drin warned, "'but it is never more dangerous than it is at night.' They say that about Hagsgate, too, Schmendrick replied. You mustn't believe everything that you hear, Drin. He walked to the door of the inn, and Molly followed him. There he turned and beamed at the folks of Hagsgate, hunched in their finery. I would like to leave you with this last thought, he told them. The most professional curse ever snarled or croaked or thundered can have no effect on a pure heart. Good night. Outside, the night lay coiled in the street, 
cobra cold and scaled with stars. There were no moon. Shmendrik stepped out boldly, chuckling to himself and jingling his coins. Without looking at Molly, he said, Suckers, to assume so lightly that all magicians dabble in death. Now, if they had wanted me to lift the curse, ah, I might have done that for no more than the meal. I might have done it for the single glass of wine. I'm glad that you didn't, Molly said savagely. They deserve their fate. They deserve worse, to leave a child out in the snow. Well, if they hadn't, he couldn't have grown up to be a prince. Hadn't you ever been in a fairy tale before? The magician's voice was kind and drunken, and his eyes were as bright as new money. The hero has to make the prophecy come true, and the villain is the one who has to stop him. Though, in another kind of story, it's more often the other way around. And the hero has to be in trouble from the moment of his birth, or he's not a real hero. It's a great relief to find out about Prince Lear. I've been waiting for this tale to lead to turn up to a leading man. The unicorn was there as a star is suddenly there, moving a little way ahead of them, a sail in the dark. Molly said, if Lear is the hero, what is she? That's different. Haggard and Lear and Drin and you and I, we are all in a fairy tale and must go where it goes. But she is real. She is real. Schmendrick yawned and hiccuped and shivered all at once. We had better hurry, he said. Perhaps we should have stayed the night, but old Drin makes me nervous. I'm sure I deceived him completely, but all the same. It seemed to Molly, dreaming and waking as she walked, that Hagsgate had stretched itself like a paw to hold the three of them back, curling around them and batting them gently back and forth, so that they trod in their own tracks over and over. In a hundred years, they reached the last house and the end of the town. In another fifty years, they had blundered through the damp fields, the vineyards, and the crouching orchards. Molly dreamed that sheep leered at them from the treetops, that cold cows stepped on their feet and shoved them off the withering path. But the light of the unicorn sailed on ahead, and Molly followed it, awake or asleep. King Haggard's castle was stalking in the sky, a blind black bird that fished the valley by night. Molly could hear the breathing of its wings. Then the unicorn's breath stirred in her hair, and she heard Schmendrick asking, How many men? Three men, the unicorn said. They have been behind us since we left Hagsgate, but now they are coming swiftly. Listen. Steps too soft for their quickness, voices too muffled to mean any good. The magician rubbed his eyes. Perhaps Drin has started to feel guilty about underpaying his poisoner, he murmured. Perhaps his conscience is keeping him awake. Anything is possible. Perhaps I have feathers. He took Molly by the arm and pulled her down into a hard hollow by the side of the road. The unicorn lay nearby, still as moonlight. Daggers gleamed like fishtails in the dark sea. A voice, suddenly loud and angry, I tell you, we've lost them. We passed them a mile back, while I heard that rustling. I'll be damned if I run any further. Be still, a second voice whispered fiercely. Do you want them to escape and betray us? You're afraid of the magician, but you'd do better to be afraid of the Red Bull. If Haggard finds out about our half of the curse, he'll send the bull to trample us all into crumbs. The first man answered in a softer tone. It isn't that I'm afraid. A magician without a beard is no magician at all, but we're wasting our time. They left the road and cut across the country as soon as they knew we were following. We would chase them along here all night and never come up with them. Another voice, wearier than the first two. We have chased them all night. Look over there. Dawn is coming. Molly found that she had wiggled halfway under Schmendrick's black cloak and buried her face in a clump of spiny dead grass. She dared not raise her head, but she opened her eyes and saw that the air was glowing strangely light. The second man said, You're a fool. It's a good two hours to morning, and besides, we're headed west. In that case, the third voice replied, I'm going home. Footsteps started briskly back up the road. The first man called, Wait! Don't go! Wait! I'll go with you! To the second man, he muttered hastily, 
I'm not going home. I just want to retrace our tail a trail a little. I think I still heard them somewheres here. And I've dropped my tinderbox somewheres. Molly could hear him edging off as he spoke. Damn you for cowards, the second man spoke. Wait a moment then. Will you wait while I try what Drin told me? The retreating footsteps hesitated and he chanted loudly. Warmer than summer, more filling than food, sweeter than woman and drearier than blood. Hurry, the third voice said. Hurry, look at the sky. What is this nonsense? Even the second man's voice was growing nervous. It isn't nonsense. Drin treats his money so well that it cannot bear to be parted from him. Most touching relationship that you'd ever seen. This is the way he calls to it. He went on rapidly, quavering a little. Stronger than water and kinder than dub, say the name of the one that you love. Drin! rang the gold coins in Smendrick's purse. Drin, 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 drin! Then everything happened. The ragged black cloak whipped against Molly's cheek as Smendrick rolled to his knees, groping desperately for the purse. It buzzed like a rattlesnake in his hand. He hurled it far into the brush, but the three men were running at them together, daggers as red as though they had already struck. Beyond King Haggard's castle, a burning brightness was rising, breaking into the night like a great shoulder. The magician stood erect, menacing the attackers with demons, metamorphoses, paralyzing ailments, and secret judo holds. Molly picked up a rock. With an old, gay, terrible cry of ruin, the unicorn reared out of her hiding place. Her hooves came slashing down like a rain of razors, her mane raged, and on her forehead she wore a plume of lightning. The three assassins dropped their daggers and hid their faces, and even Molly grew and Schmendrick cowered before her. But the unicorn saw none of them. Mad, dancing, sea-white, she belled her challenge again, and the brightness answered her with a bellow like the sound of ice breaking up in the spring. Drin's men fled, stumbling and shrieking. Haggard's castle was on fire, tossing wildly in a suddenly cold wind. Molly said aloud, But it has to be the sea. It's supposed to be. She thought that she could see a window, as far away as it was, and a gray face. Then the red bull came.